morning. We're so glad that you could be a part of our worship service this morning. Our worship service is already in progress. I'm Apostle Amos Robinson. If you'd like to, like to learn more about our ministry, you can go to our website at www.arms.cc. That's A-R-M-S dot C-C. If you'd like to sow a tithe, a donation, a gift, or an offering with the ministry, you can go to arms.cc and click on the giving link. If you'd like to attend our local worship service, we'd love to have you come and worship with us on Sundays at 10.30 Eastern Time, 9.30 Central Time, and we have Bible study on Wednesdays at 7.30 Eastern Time, 6.30 Central Time. We're so glad that you're uh, with us this morning and worshiping with us. Our message for this Pentecost is, do you need help? Praise God. And that might be a popular message at this time, praise God, because there may be a lot of people that need help. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting as the Holy Spirit has unfolded this for us in this morning, and he's given it to us. Our text for this message, it comes out of Genesis, the third chapter, and the 12th verse. It comes out of our foundation text for our message this morning. It comes out of Genesis, the third chapter, and 12th verse. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Praise God. And so we're going to get more into that in just a moment. I just wanted to take a moment. Uh, on this Pentecost Sunday, we're experiencing uh, some protests and the violence that is going around the nation uh, just in the past week uh, leading up here to Pentecost Sunday. And I just want to take just a moment to address that. Uh, I, I want to speak to this injustice justice in relationship to George Floyd. Uh, we can see by evidence, by video evidence, that the person was, was killed. And we know that this goes against God's word. You know, peaceful pro protests are fine. There's nothing wrong having a peaceful protest. But looting and vandalism is not okay, and it's not fine. Stealing and vandalism also goes against God's word. And so as saints... Remember, as saints, we can judge the behavior, but we cannot judge the motives of people. So do not be cowarded down a position if you were to judge behavior and someone says, well, you're judging. No, you're not. You can say if someone is stealing, that's not right. <laughs> and that's not passing judgment. You're just judging the behavior. Uh, if, if, if someone is uh, uh, doing an act which is not godly, you can speak, and it's recorded in the Bible, you can speak to that behavior. Now, you can't judge an individual. And it also, it does not uh, give us uh, the license to be able to become critical toward people or to become condemning toward people or to become cynical about people. It doesn't give us a license to do that. But we certainly can judge behavior. And uh, we have the right to do that as saints. And so we urge you to pray for our nation during this critical time. We have a sample prayer posted on our website at www.arms.cc. That's arms.cc. And see, we would invite you to cooperate with us in this prayer, praying for our nation, for healing and restoration, and for, and for justice, and even in this case here of George Floyd. So on this Pentecost Sunday, it's important. You know, Pentecost is an important because it's important to God. Pentecost isn't, didn't just start with the Christian church. It started hundreds of years ago back in Exodus. It was called the Festival of Harvest originally. It was called the Festival of Weeks. It was called the Festival of Pentecost. And now currently in our Jewish community, it's called Shavuot. And so it's celebrated this past Sabbath, uh, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, the Jewish synagogues, it's celebrated as Shavuot. And so one of the things that the Lord, during this time of the festival of Pentecost, the Lord brings and brings back to our remembrance the, the importance to be faithful in tithing and the importance to be faithful in offering. He brings this up in our hearts during this time. Now, why would he do that? Because it's important to him, praise God. We should be faithful in tithing and offering. Now, there are only two times when it's valid to tithe, okay? There's only two times when it's valid to tithe. And a tithe means giving to the Lord 10% of our income, and an offering is over and above that. Uh, the only two valid times to tithe is when you have the money to tithe, number one, and number two, when you don't have the money to tithe. Those are the only two valid times 
it's valid to tithe. Okay? When you don't have the money and when you do have the money. In other words, there is never a time when you should. Uh, my spiritual father was always inspirational to me in that. He was sitting in a service and he didn't have any money. This is a time when he was starting out and he didn't have so much as a penny in his pocket. And he went to church. And the minister ministered and he felt he should give $10. But he didn't have $10. So he said, Lord, you told me that I got to give $10, but I don't have any money. So what he did is he took a button, <laughs> off, he tore a button off his shirt. And when they, he said, Lord, I'm giving this. This is my $10. I'm giving this right now. I believe you're going to get that $10 of me before this service is out. I'll put my button in right now. See, it's the only valid time to tithe is when you have it and don't have it, see. So he didn't have it. So he gave a button. He said he got up out of the pew, was heading toward the back door, and a deacon in the church came running after him. He said, brother. He said, yeah. I, the Holy Ghost just came on me, and I felt compelled to give you $10. He said, praise God, I received that by faith. He went back to where the ushers were counting the money, knocked on the door. Hey, I got a button in one of them buckets. It's got to be changed for this $10 bill. <laughs> <Praise> <laughs> God. See, there's only two times when it's, when it's appropriate to tithe. When you have the money and when you don't, praise God. That was the only two times. So, but God brings us to our remembrance during these, this festival of harvest, this festival of the weeds, this festival of Pentecost, Shavuot during the Christian uh, Pentecost. So another thing the Lord brings to our mind this morning at Pentecost is we should be people that walk in forgiveness. Tithings and offerings, it reminds us in this morning how important it is and to bring a special offering on this day. And number two, we should be people that walk in forgiveness. On Pentecost, he talks about the importance of forgiveness of forgiving your brother and sister. Those that have wronged you, have done something wrong. Remember I talked about my spiritual father back in the day when there was a big thing going on about, you know, how, how African Americans have been wronged in the community. He got out in front of the believers, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people and said, Father, we don't, the white race is sin against black people in our country. I repent. If I've done anything wrong, get it out of my heart. I love my black brother, my black sister. <laughs> Find you a black brother and sister and hug them and apologize to them and treat them good, praise God. They're our brothers and sisters. Well, he's trying to operate in forgiveness, praise God. Ask him, and then he did that. Matter of fact, I remember he did it. He said, forgive me. If I did anything wrong, this is about black brothers and sisters. Forgive me. I, I ask for forgiveness right now, praise God, from everybody. Well, that's the way you do it, see. That's what in Pentecost, he brings forgiveness to heart. Another thing he remembers that he brings out for Pentecost, that we should be, we should be kind to the poor. Concerned about the poor. This ministry has donated 2,000 meals to those who are poor in the community. Amen. And if you tithe and offer to this ministry, it's just like you've given 2,000 meals. Because what the ministry does, you do. Praise God. Because you enable it to do it. Do you give it? So, it? so if you tithe and offer to this ministry, it's as if you gave 2,000 meals yourself. Praise God. We should be another thing that the Lord brings out. We should be considerate of those who work for us in the workplace. If we're managers or leaders in the workplace, we have to be considerate of our workers. When we think about this, especially during COVID. And I've even seen where some leaders are saying they're going to pay their employees' salaries out of their own money. Some of the owners of businesses have said that. Praise God. He said, I'm going to keep my employees paid. You've got to pay it in my own savings. Now, that's what you call operating in the spirit of Pentecost, praise God. That's operating in a good spirit. Now, you can't, obviously, you can't go broke. You know, you're going to have to make evaluations, you know. But <coughs> as long as we can, you know, do what we can do, praise God. We're going to do the best we can do. Well, they're concerned. I remember during uh, one of the crises we had, period, one of the business leaders said, I won't take a dollar out of this business. If it'll keep everybody working, praise God. I'll cut my salary to a dollar. I remember him saying that. And that's good. That's leadership, praise God. He's trying to show leadership there. I'd rather keep it, give my salary, and spread it across to the people and see if that'll help. You know, if it'll make hip things work, we can minimize layoffs. And also, the Lord brings up another point here for Pentecost. Keep the importance of the Lord's Supper in front of us. 
we have to value the Lord's Supper. And if we value the Lord's Supper, then we value the Lord's death, resurrection, and ascension, right? We value the Lord Jesus. We have to keep, because what did Jesus do on Passover? He said, this bread represents what? My body broken for you. This wine represents what? My blood shed for you. So we got to keep the body and blood of Jesus in front of us. Got to keep that in the forefront of our thinking. We bring that back to highlight that in this morning that the Lord Jesus' sacrifice has to be kept in front of us as well on this Pentecost. We want to realize that there is special grace available for us this morning as we celebrate Pentecost. There's special grace available to us right now. Praise God. A special grace. Now, let's look over here at Acts before we get into our main message, Acts, the second chapter, and the first verse. And we'll look through a few verses here. We're going to go through probably Acts 1 to 1, down to 13, perhaps. We'll see what the Father directs here. But we're looking at Acts. We're looking at Acts, the second chapter, and the first verse. Today is Pentecost. It's a very important festival of God. It's a very important day in the kingdom of God. Pentecost is. So let's look here at Acts, the second chapter in the first verse. Now we bring it over into the New Testament. Amen? So it says what? When the day of Pentecost came, well, that's what we have right now, the day of Pentecost. This is our Pentecost day. They were all gathered together in one place. Well, we're gathered together in one place, whether we're on the phone or we're either watching the broadcast or what have you. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now there's a such thing as a baptism in the Holy Ghost that makes this possible, praise God. Amen? Amen, Amen praise God. <laughs> All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and speak of the tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who speak in Galileans? Then how is it each of them hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Ferga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And so we realize that what this means is that this was really the birth of the church. When the baptism came upon those early believers, this was the birth of the New Testament church. And so this is a very, so Pentecost, which was first celebrated back in Exodus, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, was foretelling of this event, of this would happen, that God would come and manifest himself in a greater way among his people. And you know that made God really happy, amen? Praise God. So we realize that this penny cost that God wants to remind us we should be faithful in our tithing and offering. There are only two times it's valid to tithe and offer. And that's when you have it and when you don't have it. It's the only two times. That, so in other words, it doesn't like should be happening all the time. Praise God. It doesn't matter. We, are, we should be people that walk in forgiveness. We should be concerned about the poor. If you give into this ministry, we've given 2,000 meals to the poor. So far this year, we're going to give many more. But if you, if, if you give into this ministry, it's like you've given it yourself. We should be concerned of those who work for us in our workplace, those that we work with, colleagues. That's important. And we got to keep the importance of the Lord's sacrifice for us, the Lord's Supper in front of us as well. There's a special grace in now. Now let's get back to the word that God has us for Pentecost. I want to give a, a little bit of background on Pentecost there. Let's go back to Genesis, the third chapter, and we're going to look at the first verse. So our, our message for Pentecost is, do you need help? And this message title has a question mark on it. Do you need help? 
And the text for our message is Genesis 3.12. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Praise God. Now let's go over, let's look and see what the Lord would have for us in this morning around this message. Because it's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting message this morning. Praise God. Let's look at the first verse. The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord had made. Well, the devil, the serpent is representative of the devil. He's still shrewd today. <laughs> okay. A lot of trickery. You know. A lot of trickery. He's still tricking today. Tricking people today. One day he asked the woman, talking about Eve, did God really say you must eat the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? He's still doing that same thing. <laughs> you know, he's still asking questions, trying to get you to doubt, and so forth. Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only one fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. That's the second verse, right? A third verse. God said you must not eat it or touch it or if you do, you will die. Fourth verse, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. In other words, it's okay. It really is. Look, uh, well, you didn't mean to steal that. I mean, you had a need and, and you couldn't help yourself. It just, I mean, surely, you know, I mean, people can be, I mean, you know, God don't understand that, you know. Uh, uh, it's just a little theft. I mean, you know, it, it's not much, you know. Uh, yeah, that's how we start. It starts out small. I mean, bank robbers don't start robbing banks. They run up, typically start with something small, stealing something small. And then it builds up. You see, the devil's trying to get his foot in the door, see? Uh, well, you need to go out to that sports bar because your wife didn't treat you right. You know, you deserve to be treated right. The girl winks at him when he's there. Now, he's only had a couple of drinks. Two-fifths of the wind. Uh, that's a pretty girl. You know, she winked at you. Your wife didn't even treat you right. No way. This is what it says. The devil will start coming with these things. And before you know it, you're going to end up in a trap. Amen. Praise God. See, that's how he come. You won't die. You know. Remember, variety is a spice of life. You know, he'll start coming with phrases and things that, you know, try to justify the actions. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your, this is what the saints say, he knows your eyes will be open. Say, so that woman, she might even like you better than your wife. But she, she winking at you, look at you like that, you know. That's what they do, the devil do. And you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. Sixth verse, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. Yeah, that's what it do. It looked good. If she do look good, boy, she's like younger than my wife. And makeup she got on look good too. Yeah, that's what happens. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. <laughs> okay. So she took some of her fruit and ate it. Then she gave to her husband. See? Now, she got, she was deceived, right? And that's why her husband and wife got to be together. Because sometimes the devil can come in through the wife or the husband, right? And this came, he came through the wife. And he just so happy with his wife, he just went along with the program. <laughs> He's got, now, he shouldn't have done that. That wasn't appropriate for him to do that, okay? Who was with her? Okay, baby. You know, you can hear him now. Okay, sweetheart. <laughs> no, no uh-uh. This ain't okay. And he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then God, then the Lord God said to the man, where are you? Now God knew where he was. <laughs> he knew exactly where he was. He wanted to see what he was going to say. Uh, who told you you were naked? Where did you get that from? I didn't teach you that. The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree? whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? In other words, have you sinned? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. The Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? What did she say? The serpent deceived me, she replied, that's why I ate. Now, Eve was deceived here. 
But does it say that Adam was? No. She had an excuse. Now, she allowed, see, the devil will deceive you into doing something he's ain't supposed to do. Okay? First of all, you should have been at the sports bar. If you got mad, what'd you want? You shouldn't be there. You should stay right at home and, and worked it out. Now, you can maybe go get you, a, a, I like coffees at McDonald's, the cafe. They make some good, they make good lattes at <laughs> McDonald's. So I would, I'm not trying to promote McDonald's, but I would have went there and got me a latte, you know, at McDonald's, right? Something like that. Well, he went to the sports bar. This is a true story. The guy went to McDonald's, got it, sat with his wife. Girl winked at him. Now, he's had two or three drinks. He's not, you know, he's not feeling it for his wife. And what do you know? So she probably had a couple of drinks. She come over and sit by him. You're cute. <laughs> you know? And what happens to him? He falls into sin. He commits adultery on his wife. He ends up ultimately and ends up in divorce. Right? So she was deceived, but Adam was not. So Adam's sin was actually worse. Than Eve's because she let herself, she was deceived, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. It, it doesn't it say right there, it says, the serpent deceived me. And that's why I ate. But he was just going along with his wife. No, uh-uh. No, 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 no. You can't do that, praise God. You could have family members that want you to go along with something that's wrong. Now you can be kind and gentle to them and gracious to them, but you can't go along with wrong. Unrighteousness. So what was happening here is, notice what happened. E, Adam, blamed the woman. <laughs> In other words, he got into the blaming situation, right? Blame. You see this going on in society all the time. It's somebody else's fault. And then what happened to the woman? So he went to Adam, it's a woman. He went to the woman, it's the serpent. <laughs> There's no accountability here. So pride, when we have pride, it, we, 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 we hide our actions. We don't deal with them truthfully and honestly when we have pride. If we are humble, humility takes responsibility for wrong. What should have Adam said? You gave me the charge, I sinned, I take full responsibility for it. Because he was trying to blame his wife, like he was throwing his wife under the bus. You would say in today's parlance, he would throw her under the bus. So really, if he loved his wife, should he have done that? No, he should have said, I take responsibility, I'm the head here. And I let this go on. When I saw Eve talking to that serpent, I should have said, honey, I love you. I'm, set, I'm the head here. Stop it. Now get over here and wait for that serpent. And quit listening to him because he tried to get us to do something we're supposed to do. Now, God left me. I'm in charge here. And she shouldn't have gotten anything like, well, you don't tell me what to do. She said, yes, husband. That God didn't tell us that. We, I got to shut up and do what you're right. I'm wrong. That's how you get help. Humility takes responsibility. Blaming others. It, now, just, I just want you to write this down because this is one of the central points of this message today. This Pentecost message. Do you need help is our message. And this is the central point. Blaming. If you blame others, you won't get the help. If you blame others, you won't get the help. Do you need help? You're not going to get it if you blame others. Help is not provided if we blame others. We have to take responsibility for our own actions and for that which we do. We can't cast it off on somebody else. You know, If we're not doing well, and a lot of we're talking about because there's rioting going on now in our community, racism. Do you identify more with your nationality than you do with Christ? If it is, that's a problem. Because I thought it read in the Bible that we always went in Christ. I don't care who it is or where you at on planet Earth. If you will release your faith on the word and walk with God, you coming up. Prosperity is coming. I don't care whether you're red, black, blue, brown, green, purple, pink. I don't care what you are. 
You coming up. Is God respect their persons? No. Uh-uh. Who's a, he's a whosoever God. Whosoever will. And he's looking for a whosoever. <laughs> He'll do it. Praise God. They coming up. Don't identify more with your ethnic background than with God. Identify more with God. Because we've been transferred into a new creature. We've been told all things have passed away. All things have become new. Isn't that what the word tells us? Mm -hmm. Aren't we the seed of Abraham? If you want to know your nationality, it doesn't matter what ethnic race you come from. In Christ, we're all Jews. Praise God. Amen. 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 We've been engrafted in through Christ. Praise God. So don't get so tied up in your ethnic background. Get tied up in your identity with Christ. He will bring, it will bring you victory. Remember, pride hides. Humility takes responsibility. And blame others and you won't get help. You'll position yourself so you can't get help. Because you're blaming somebody else. I weigh 500 pounds. Well, my wife, all she buys is Twinkies and potato chips and dip. And that's all I can eat. Are you blaming her? No, you ain't got to eat that stuff. If you have to, honey, give me the card. I'm going to order my own food. Then. All you're going to bring up in here and get me fat. Take God, take accountability, responsibility. I love you, sweetheart. And thank you for what you're doing, but I'm not eating that mess. I'm, I'm trying to lose weight, praise God. So you got to take accountability and responsibility. Blaming others is not going to, is going to position you for help. You can hear that during, uh, comments have been made like this over the years. The white man's kept me down. I can't accomplish nothing because of the white man. You hear people have said this. That's, uh, let me see. Hmm. Blaming others won't get you any help. Oh, I'm a Christian. I've been created new in Christ. God doesn't, irrespective of persons. He's not a respecter of persons. He don't care nothing about that. Oh, what you mean? I'm the seed of Abraham? You mean the same blessing they got I can get? Praise God. Well, that's what I'm going to focus on. That's what I'm going I'm to I'm 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 take that, what I used to say, and let that go by the wayside. Now I'm going to put something, some truth in my mouth, and I'm coming up. I remember there's a there's a movie I can't remember the name of it now about how these African Americans during uh, uh, a racist time in America they became wealthy businessmen these two these two uh, uh, I, I know one of them was I think maybe both were several people in black African American men that were involved in it and you know what they did that was racist they wouldn't sell them a building that they had. I want to say it's in New York City or Chicago one of these big cities and needed this for their business. You know what they did? They went and got a white guy, paid him, and let him negotiate for him. They think they were selling it to him. And guess whose name was on the title? They was. They didn't get caught up in, you know. <laughs> no, they just saw the way to the success. All right, well, we're going to pay a white guy. We'll let him front for us. When the paperwork come out, our name going to be on it. God got away. Let's be a success. Let's be prosperity. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, we know that wasn't right, but that still ain't stopped their prosperity. They found a way through. Well, guess what? If you're a child of God, prosperity is coming to you. Get that foolish thought about uh, 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 you can't accomplish nothing and you can't do it and blaming somebody else. No, you can do it. Now, the problem is if it's not working for you, you need to get in the mirror. What am I doing wrong? Get down on you and start crying out to God. and It might cause some tears to come. There's some things maybe in your life that are not right and need to be adjusted. But if we're walking out the word of God, prosperity will come. This will work anywhere on the planet. Anywhere on the planet. I remember, I want to say it was in, uh, I think it's in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken. A big uh, uh, ministry there. Uh, a bishop there. I can't remember his name right now. But a bishop there. And uh, now this is in a, a country that wasn't that, and they was really poor, right? And my spiritual father went there to preach. He was surprised. They had the whole like three services. And uh, the building holds 100,000 people because <laughs> they can't get them all in there. <clears throat> and he said that they said, he said, oh, we needed a new airplane here for the ministry. And my spiritual father said, well, how did you do it? We just went out and told the people, we need to raise an offering. We need to go buy a plane. 
I don't know about you, that seems like prosperity to me. It'll work on the continent of Africa. Don't matter where it is. I remember uh, 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 Pastor Child from South Africa, uh, from South uh, uh, Korea. Got one of the largest churches in the world. And he, he came to America and he always had an entourage with him when he came. And he would visit the church. I want to say that was down in Texas. And uh, he was talking to, uh, uh, I guess he spoke at his pastor's church. And he says, what's going on around here? He said, well, you know, we're, we got a building fund. We're trying to build on the church. And we need $100,000, $150,000. He said, would that take care of it if you had that? He said, yeah. He said, give me, give me a checkbook. I wrote the man a check for $100,000, dollars say, does that take care of it? Okay, fine. That, yeah, that's what it's about. Now, how did he get that in South Korea? You know, when Pastor Child started his ministry, you know how he started? Walking. He would walk and preach to anybody that would listen <laughs> in the street corners. And then he said, you know what? He got he found out what? I can have faith and believe for some things? God want me to have some things? He said, Lord, I, I will lease my faith for a bicycle. <laughs> He's got, I'm tired of walking. I want to ride a bike. And so somebody donated a bike into the ministry. He said, man, I got this by faith. So he got riding his bike around and walking everywhere. And this is good. Man, if all my faith would work for a bicycle, it might work for a car. <laughs> so he started working. He had built up one of the biggest ministries. In, in the, uh, his church on a Sunday, they have about a million members attend. Wow. <clears throat> his Sunday school was two to 300,000. Just for Sunday school in the morning. <laughs> and he started off walking. And his first, his first faith uh, work that he did was that bicycle. He said, man, I'll leave, I'll leave my favorite. And then he was able to write a check for $100,000 for a pastor in Texas. Uh, not a problem. That, 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 that's enough? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's easy. He, he can start off walking with a bicycle, but then it built up. See, the blessing of God is that South Korea. It doesn't matter where you're at. That's immaterial. The blessing of God will come and prosper you. Let's look at Proverbs 28, 13. Boy, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm preaching myself happy this morning, praise God, Amen. on this Pentecost Sunday, praise God. See, it doesn't matter where you're at. Prosperity will come. Let's look at Proverbs 28, 13. Our message this morning is, do you need help? Well, you can't get help by blaming others. The only way you're going to get help is by dealing with yourself and evaluating yourself against what God has told you to do, has guided you to do against his word. That's the only way you're going to get help. You're going to get help by blame, putting it off on somebody else. You've got to take responsibility for yourself. Proverbs 28, 13. Let's look there. People who conceal their sins, what? Will not prosper. Let's say that together. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. <clears throat> See, you cannot hold on to your sins and expect to prosper. What does that mean? You've got to look in the mirror at yourself. If it's not working, it, I, I, let me tell you this. My spiritual father, he said this before. He said, do you, he was talking to somebody. No, he's talking to the church because he's heard so many people say things. And he said, do you think there's any possibility, there's any remote possibility, you think there's an inkling, it could be you and not God? <laughs> People want to blame God even. Right? They want to blame God. And in other words, what, he, what was he saying? Sisters and brothers, and sisters, don't blame God, blame yourself. <laughs> okay? Look in the mirror. You've got to take accountability and responsibility. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but does the verse stop there? No. But it says if they confess and what? Turn from them, they will receive mercy. So you cannot just stay in your sins. People want to, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong. We need to preach about fear today, right? We need to preach, preach about encouragement. But that's not the primary message that we need to be preaching at this pandemic time. The pandemic, God didn't cause this uh, pandemic, but he permitted it, and it is a judgment. So if your child does wrong, you spank them and then tell them it's okay what he did. <laughs> no, you spank them and then you tell them, no, you need to stop doing that. 
That's where the spanking comes. Judgment is there to bring up about repentance. And that's what we need. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We need repentance. <laughs> Let's look over here at 1 John, uh, the first chapter and the ninth verse. Let's look at 1 John, the first chapter and the ninth verse. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. Boy, this, well, we heard it already there at the last part of the 13th. If we confess and turn from our sins, we'll receive mercy. What will God do? He'll say, come on, baby. Come on, baby. I know you, 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 I know you messed up. Come, come on over here. Come, come on, let me, let me throw my uh, arms of love around you. Let's get you back on track to where you're supposed to be. Let's look at 1 John 1, 9. It says what? If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. And purify us from all unrighteousness. That's the beautiful thing we have in Christ. That if we will confess our sins and our shortcomings before the throne of grace. Come God honestly. Do you need help? You're not going to get help by blaming others. The only way you're going to get help is by examining your life. And seeing where does it line up with the word and where does it not. And what adjustments do I need to make? Praise God. Okay. So God has provided forgiveness for us. Yes, he's provided, but guess what? We need to receive it. You can't receive it if you don't confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. You got to ask him to forgive you, and then you got to position yourself to receive it. By, and you position yourself by doing that. The forgiveness is already there. We just got to receive it. We have to confess it. Because when we mess up, we need mercy. We need mercy. Remember David? How much mercy he got? He, David messed up a lot. <clears throat> but what would he do? He'd get down to his knees and plead, Oh God, have mercy on me. I messed up again. You know, I can't do it without you. Now here's a man very wealthy. David was a multi-billionaire. He was president of the country. He was the equivalent of our Supreme Court, Congress, and president all in one person. Very powerful person and a lot of wealth. And go read some of the Psalms. David, God, David would cry out, I can't make it without you. You, you. you have to be near to me. You have to tell me. He would just cry out. That's how our attitude's got to be. Amen. If you mess up, you need mercy. We have to admit our mistakes. Write that down. We need to write that down. We have to admit our mistakes. Arrogance and pride is not going to get it. No, you think of the AAA, Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the first things they tell you to do, we have to admit our mistakes. One of the first things they tell you in AAA is what? You've got to admit you're an alcoholic. Or you're going to have to admit you're a, 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 a drug addict. You've got to admit it. You can't. You gotta admit your you gotta admit your condition. That's the only way you're gonna get help. So recovery from al al uh, being alcoholic starts with admitting your situation. It's the same thing with us as God's children. If we want help, we gotta admit our situation. So what should Adam have said instead of blaming his wife? He should have said, "I messed up. Don't blame her. It's my fault. I take full responsibility because you told me she was deceived, and I let it happen." I should have gotten and said, honey bunch, I love you, baby. Give her a kiss on the cheek. Let's go. You don't boss me. Well, I'm bossing you right now, baby, because this is going to get us in trouble. So I'm sorry. I don't have to be the boss man right now <laughs> of you because this is not going to lead to good. Now, you, you, you'll thank me later once I save you from this mess. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Amen. Okay. So it's very popular today to blame others. It's always somebody else's fault. Now, can it be somebody else's fault? Yeah, it can be. But how do we approach that? Right? We approach it about what, what good can we do? And the good is going to come out of prayer. It's going to come out of the leading of the Holy Ghost. What good can we do? Right? So remember my spiritual father that came out and said, uh, when this was a, a big thing in America, he went out and said, my black brother and sister, if I've sinned against you, forgive me. God, forgive me in front of everybody. He's doing this, repenting in front of everybody, right? 
Now, I can't imagine him doing anything because he's a, he's a very loving man. But maybe, you know, he was trying to lead the way to what should be done. Well, could he have said, well, my father was prejudiced. My grandfather was prejudiced, so I could blame it on him. That's where I picked that stuff up. You know, amen. You can, you can blame it on others. You can say, my father was that way, or my grandfather, my great-grandfather was that way. No, you can't do that. I don't care what my great-grandfather did. If I'm not doing right, I got to do right, praise God. Just because my great-grandfather was a crook don't mean I got to be a crook. Or because my great-grandfather was racist don't mean I got to be racist. Okay, I repent of that sin right now. Lord, get it out of my heart. I, I remember that. He was in a service, and he had black members in his church, and he went up to him, I love you. I want you to know I, I love you <laughs> in Christ. And, 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 and he just poured out. I mean, it was a very emotional service. Uh, I don't remember if he cried or not, but he was very close to it if he didn't. Uh, you know, he just really was repentant. And all of us got to get in here. We got to love. Look, white, some of our white brothers and sisters, you got attitudes toward your black brothers. This need to change. Stop it now. And he's led the way by repenting in front of everybody. So now here's the problem with this blaming others situation because when you blame others you judge you can write this down because this is an important point you can write this down this is a very important point when you blame others you judge here's the danger in blaming others so do you need help you're not going to get help by blaming others blaming others will block you from receiving from God because why now you're you're judging others and what does judging other lead, lead to? It leads to judgment yourself, on yourself. So when you get into blaming others, that leads to you being a judge, judging others. And judgment of others leads to judgment on yourself. Amen? Praise God. So that's the danger in it. So if you, you need help in this morning, my Pentecost message this morning is do you need help? <coughs> Don't blame others because it'll block you from receiving from God. As a matter of fact, you'll bring judgment on yourself. Wasn't that what happened to Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. hmm? Praise God. Isn't that what happened to them? Didn't they get judged? Yeah, they got judged. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're the recipients of that today, of the judgment that came on them. Right. Let's look at Matthew. We're talking about, so, so let's, let's, as you make your notes here, blaming others leads to you becoming a judge. And becoming a judge leads to judgment on yourself. By the measure you judge, you'll be judged. Let's read this. Let's look at Matthew 7, 1 and 2 here. We're going to look at what Jesus said about judging others in this morning. We're going to read what Jesus said about judging others. Matthew 7, 1 through 12. So our message is Pentecost Sunday. Do you need help? And you can't get help by blaming others. And lead, which leading into judgment of others, which leads into your own judgment. It's a trap. Jesus said here, Matthew 7, 1, what? Do not judge. Now, Christians use this today, or people will use this as a defense for sin. Now, as Christians, as saints, we have the right to judge behavior. If someone is stealing something, now we can't judge that person, but we can say stealing is wrong. You shouldn't steal. We can judge the behavior. But now, you have saints even say, oh, you're judging them. No, you're not. No, no. You're not judging the individual. You're just judging the behavior. Okay? That's not, that's within your purview. But you can't judge the person. And you can't judge their motivations. You can't do that. But if someone is stealing, you can say, you know, stealing is wrong. Oh, you're just ju you're judging them. You've gone too far. Oh, no, I haven't, sweetheart. I'm within my purview in the kingdom of God. I'm not judging them or passing judgment on the, what's going to be the outcome. Because can that person that stole, can't they uh, get forgiveness? Yeah. Could they, maybe if you pray for them, could they get an early release from prison? Mm -hmm. Amen. Can they come over to the kingdom and get it all washed by the blood of Jesus? Yeah. So you can't judge what motivation. Okay, let's go on here. 
Now, here's, let me tell you what this here means here. Let me settle this Mark 7-1. Because Christians will use this as a defense to protect something that they want to do or believe in that's ungodly. Here's what this means, this word judge here in this context means. To try to determine the outcome of another person. To try to determine the outcome of another person. That's what this really means. Or to act as if you have legal jurisdiction over another person. So you can write that down. This is a definition of that word judge there in Matthew 7, 1. To try to determine the outcome of another person. Or to act as if you have legal jurisdiction over another person. So, okay, so what does Jesus mean here in do not judge? Now, I've seen this. You know what? I don't like you. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell all your friends, all the family members, how evil you are. Because I'm going to bring about a judgment upon you. I'm going to ruin your reputation. I'm going to try to destroy you. That's what he's talking about here. Has this been done? Oh, yeah. You have somebody that judges you at work, a colleague, let's say. They spread rumors that maybe a lie is about you. They tell the boss bad things about you. They go on Facebook and post evil things about you. They tell your close friends evil things. They go and tell your family or evil things. What are they trying to do? They're trying to bring a judgment on you. They're trying to, they're, they have decided they are the judge and the jury and they're the execution of that judgment. They're going to bring about your destruction. They're working toward it actively. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about you passing judgment on some uh, sin. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if somebody's in, it, it has, it, exhibiting sinful behavior, okay, if somebody you know is in an adultery relationship, you say, that person is in adultery, that's wrong. Oh, you're judging them. You shouldn't judge them. Or somebody's in a homosexual relationship, homosexuality is a sin. Oh, you're judging them. Why? Why do they come up with that defense? Because it's okay for them. Adultery is okay for them. They don't have a problem with it. And they're trying to come up with a defense to hold to what they've done, righteousness that they want to believe. But the judgment he's talking about here is not that. It's talking about, and this has happened. This happens. People will judge other in terms. They, they're going to determine your outcome. They're going to get you fired off your job. And they actively work at it. They tell the boss bad things about you. Anything you give to them is bad work when you know it's excellent work. They tell your colleagues, touch your colleagues about you. This is judge, and this is bad. Jesus said what? Do not judge. In other words, try to determine an outcome of another person or act as if you have legal jurisdiction over another person or you too will be judged. So you're positioning, when you're trying to work, remember what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit says? Uh, what Satan is meant for evil, God is meant for good. Remember we just read there in Genesis, you tried to do this for evil. Now, didn't Joseph in the beginning blessed? And what happened to them? They had to come to him and ask him for food to live. And was Joseph merciful? Yes, he was. He showed the heart of Christ, the heart of God. For in the same way you judge others, what? You will be judged. As you work against to destroy the reputation, you attack, you tell the co-workers, she ain't no good. You tell the boss, she ain't no good. She sends you excellent work. Oh, this is horrible. This is the worst kind of work I ever saw. And you know it's excellent. On uh, Facebook, then they go to Facebook. Uh, social media platforms. She ain't no good. Text your friends, your family. She ain't no good. Now, see, they're, they're operating in this judgment here. Now, you know what they're positioning themselves for? The same judgment on them. And that's why Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good. So when we walk in nice, you, know, you may have to un un block them on Facebook. You may have to block them in your text. You may have to go to the boss and say, look, she's telling lies about me. You, have, you pray about what you do, but you may have to do these things. But operate in love. Don't go there with the boss and say, yeah, she ain't no good. <laughs> go there and say, you know, <clears throat> I have to tell you, I understand that some 
Uh, there have been some misrepresentations about me. You're very, very kind. It was an outright lie. Some misrepresentations about me, and I want to make sure I, I clarify this up. Praise God. And guess what happened? Now you've opened that person up for what? The judgment themselves. Let God bring it to them. Oh, it'll work. Oh, it works. I've seen it work. Praise God. So, or you too will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the harsher that person is to try to get you fired off your job, they're going to be positioned themselves to receive the same. But you operating in love and forgiveness. you loving your enemies. I always say, if somebody disliked me this much, where's the checks? Praise God. I thought you would love the enemies. If I'm that bad, man, I'm waiting for this $1,000 check to come. The way you're talking about me, it must be a $10,000, $100,000 check coming in. Praise God. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do if you're living in Christ. You're trying to love them. Because I can tell you how it ends up. You walk in love like that, <laughs> it's not going to be good for that person. And they don't, you don't want. What did David tell Saul? When Saul was trying to kill him, did David return it back? No. Try to kill him back. No, he didn't. And this was God's anointing. Oh, David looked at it. This is the man of God. How did David respond to that? David tried to bless him. He, he tried to preserve his life. And ultimately, David said something to Saul that should have woke him up. He said, God will judge between me and you. Now, you don't want that. No, no, no. I'm not going to touch you. You didn't know any of God. I almost say positive things about you, try to bless you. Now, what did, it, what did that judgment entail for Saul? His death. What happens? God let God see. You don't want God to judge you. Okay? Because if, if God gets involved with the judgment, ooh, it could be brutal. <laughs> his judgment could be brutal. Anybody forget about Noah and the ark? <laughs> you know, I mean, his judgment could be wipeouts. Okay. And remember what God told Moses. Remember how the nation of Israel was acting up? And God, it was, he was upset with the Israelites. I mean, he was living with them. And Moses was up there in that mountain talking to God. You know what God, God told Moses? Tell you what. Let's get rid of them. I'll get rid of every one of them Israelites. And I'm going to start all over with you. we we'll start with you again. You got some wives. We have some more children. We just start off with I got all the time in the world. I live in infinity. You know, I, I, time, I don't, time is not a concern for me. We just, let another, we just tack on another thousand years if we need to to this thing. That's what needed to be happening. And what did Moses do? He said, Lord, you can't do that. He said, what? He said, you brought these people out here. What will the world say if you let your people get destroyed? They know you're leaving them. You're right. And it's the only scripture in the Bible where it says God repented. He was up, he was living at them. But even God could re, he'll change. You know, that's how that shows you his mercy. When you know he had his end of his rope. And if you come up with that, he, he was thankful he picked Moses. He says, Moses, you a good man. You good. All right, you're my man. You know, interceded for him. You're a priest, a minister. Before me. All right. Let's figure out what we can do. Let's try to get back in here and see what we can do with these people. Praise God. To get him back where they're supposed to be. That's how God is. God's very merciful. He's a merciful God. So we have the ability to judge and evaluate behavior in comparison to the Word of God, but we have no ability to judge ourselves and to judge motives and, and uh, individuals. We don't have any place to do that. Now, here's, here's a key point I wanted to share with you this morning. Praise God. Boy, God is good. God is so good. Here's a key point I want to mention to you this morning. When things are not going right, I want you to write this down. When things are not going right, ask yourself, did you miss it somehow? When things are not going right, maybe something you're involved in or, or an activity or an effort that you're trying to move forward with, ask yourself, did you miss it somehow? In other words, should I be here? 
Or should I be involved with this? So what are we doing? Are we blaming others by doing that? No. We're valuing what? Ourselves. Is this something I really should be involved in? It doesn't seem like the grace of God is there for this. Look, we go back to God. So when things are not going right, comma, ask yourself, did you miss it somewhere? When things are not going right, you ask yourself, did you miss it somewhere? Should I be here? Should I be involved with this? Okay. And you'll think about it. If we stay and do the righteous thing, it can save a lot of problems. It really can by doing the righteous thing. Let's look over here at Genesis, the third chapter, as we work on wrapping up this morning. Let's look at Genesis, the third chapter, and the 14th verse. Genesis 3 and 14. And we kind of commented on this, uh, we kind of mentioned on this earlier, but we just, we'll look at it here. Now, out of this, uh, when we start blaming others and we get into judgment, it leads to judgment ourselves. Now look at, the, look at Genesis 3 and 14. Then God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. So what does it lead to the serpent? He becomes what? What, what is the judgment? Curse. Okay. Now going down here to, to the, uh, the 16th verse. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen your pain of your pregnancy when you give birth. What was this? What was this? A, what? A judgment that came out of it. And look, what did he say to the man? Since you listened to your wife. <laughs> implied is that you didn't listen to me. You put what your wife say above me. And that ain't good. What, what would that be called in the Ten Commandments? Idol worshippers. That's a violation of the commandment of God. And ate from this tree, whose fruit I command you not to eat, the ground is what? Cursed. All your life you'll struggle to scratch a living. In other words, there was a judgment. <coughs> so when we blame, well, if we need help, we don't want to blame others. If we blame others, it's going to lead to us judging others, and it's going to lead to judgment in lives on our life ourselves. It's going to lead to a judgment. Now, let's look over here at Genesis 4 as we work on closing here this morning. And this will be the last uh, scriptural reference that we make here this morning before we close. Genesis, the fourth chapter, the first to the tenth verse. Genesis, the fourth chapter, and the first to the tenth verse. Our Pentecost message this morning is, do you need help? And we can't get help by blaming others. You need help? Go look in the mirror. Because <laughs> it ain't God. I can guarantee you that the problem is not with God. I always remember that. My spiritual father said, do you think there's any possibility, any chance, any inkling, it could be you and not God? <laughs> That's where it is. That's where the problem is. It's, with, it, it's you. Okay, let's look here as we want to close this morning. Genesis 4, 1 until we close our Pentecost service. Adam made love to his wife Eve. We know what that means, I think. Husband and wives do, right? And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth the man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Times were good. Honey bunch, a bun couple bunnies of joy on the scene. You know, it was a good time. A little baby. Now, Abel kept flocks. Now, you know, in two passages here, they done grew up. He's got to give adults. Uh, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Now look at this. In the course of time. That already tells us something. Was it immediate that he was bringing these fruits? No. Well, I have something left over. Well, if I have anything left over, I'll give it to God as an offering. Uh, that gives us a clue this is not good. Okay. God loves offerings, but he wants the offerings to be what? First. 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 When God gave his son, he gave his first and only son. He gave his best. That's how he works. In the court, okay. 
Uh, and Abel brought an offering fat, look at this, fat portions. What does that tell you? Luscious offering. You know, it ain't no skip course of time. It's the prime offerings, right? That's another first one of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But Cain and his offering did not look with favor. Well, why didn't it? Why didn't it? Because Cain was given it begrudgingly. He said, well, you know, if I have something left over, well, let me make sure I got everything paid and everything done. If there's anything left over, I'll give it to God. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't get the favor of God, right? So Cain what? Became what? Angry, and his face was downcast. He's upset. But why is Abel brother? Why is Abel offering better than mine? Were you prejudiced? Were you discriminating? Huh? Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? So what is God telling him? The problem is not me, and the problem is not your brother. The problem is with who? You. You got a problem. Go look in the mirror. Well, no mirrors at the time, but go look in the light. You see reflection. It's you. But if you do, look at what he's saying here. But if you do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. You get ready. To, your, 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 your attitude is sinful in terms of your offerings to me. And this is going to lead to problems with you. He said, look, but if you do what's right, look, if you, it desires to have you, but you must rule over. You got to rule over the sin. You got to rule over the choices and decisions you're making in your life. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain, what, attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So what was uh, Abel, uh, Cain doing? He was, was he blaming himself for his cheap self, his cheap giving? An unrighteous giving, or was he blaming Abel? Blaming. He was blaming Abel. And matter of fact, he became a judge over Abel. He determined what happened with his life because he took it. So let me see. Blaming leads to judging, and judging leads to what? Judgment. Now let's see how that worked out for him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? God knew where he was at. He <laughs> what had happened. I don't know, replay. Yeah, right. Am I my brother's keeper? See, people make up all kinds of excuses for the things they want to do and don't do. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your, blood, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Okay. So anger and depression are indicators that you're yielding to darkness or the evil one. But that gives us a little clue as what's happening around the country right now. Protesting is legitimate, but not looting and vandalism and killing people. That's not legitimate. Anger and depression are indicators that you're yielding to darkness or the evil one. Now, I'm going to give you this. This is my last thing I'm going to say as I close up this morning. You write this down. If you won't believe the truth, comma, then all you have left is lies. If you won't believe the truth, then all you have left is lies. If you won't believe the truth, comma, then all you have is lies. Isn't that what Cain did? He started to believe the lie. The devil will whisper in your ear uh, suggestions. He'll bring thoughts across your mind. Do you have to believe them and receive them? No, you can resist them. That's what Cain should have did. No, he got angry. And you know, and to kill his brother, you know, he meditated on that. He meditated on that. Gable got me looking bad before God. If he did like I did in the course of time, in other words, hold back, then he wouldn't have me looking bad. <laughs> you know. Why, why can't he do what I do? Right? And uh, it wasn't Cain the firstborn? <laughs> I'm the oldest brother. You be following my example. No, you follow your little brother examples. He got it right. Praise God. <coughs> so, this Pentecost Sunday is a very special day because it's special to God. 
And you know, during this day, during this Pentecost, we know that this is a time when God wants to bring us back, remind us how the importance of tithing and offering. He wants us, and there's only two valid times to tithe, when you have the money, when you don't. We have to walk in forgiveness. He wants to remind us of that this morning, that we should be concerned about the poor. Those are our challenges. Our ministry has given over, uh, over 2,000 meals to those in the community. And those that tithe and offer this ministry, you, you, just like you get it yourself. We have to be considered those who work for us and work with us in the workplace. And we have to keep the importance of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's body and his blood that was shed for us as we walk, as we take away from this Pentecost. And we, and we want to take away also, too, that if we need, do you need help is the question of the message. And you can't get help by blaming others. Blaming others leads to being in judgment of others. Being in judgment of others leads to judgment ourselves upon us. Jesus has taught us that. And don't, don't be cowed down by people. When you call out behavior, uh, and they say, oh, you're judging me. No, 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 no. Just because you're saying somebody stole something, that doesn't mean you're judging them. You're just saying they stole something. Praise God. And, but, but, but Christians will use that as a defense to justify what they want. If they think stealing is okay, they can say, you're judging them. You're judging me. No, I'm not, honey. I'm going to pray for you. Matter of fact, I hope you can get out of that stealing and get out of that wrongdoing. And remember, I want to leave this with you too. To judge in 7-1 means that try to determine the outcome of another person or to act if you have legal jurisdiction over that person. In other words, a person that is in judgment of another will go to work to try to destroy them. They will talk to their family members. They'll talk to their co-workers. They'll talk to the boss. They'll get on social media to try to bring about a judgment upon you, get you fired from the job or whatever. That's judging he's talking about. He's not talking about you calling out behavior. Christians have interpreted that today to mean like, oh, you can't even speak about sin. Now, somebody said, well, you can't speak on that because that's judgment. No, it's not. It's okay to say it's not okay to murder. If somebody murdered somebody, you can say they murdered them. You're not judging them. You just call out what it is. Okay, it's not your place to stand in judgment them. That's God's place. But you can certainly judge the behavior. And that, but it does not give us a license to be critical, cynical about people. We're supposed to be hopeful about people. Amen? Yeah.